I like the long one. I don't like watching the changes. <laughs> doesn't do well okay, with so me. We don't want to do it that way. No. Oh. No. oh. oh. oh yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, perfect. It's all that leaning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is the district's charter review committee capacity interview with the applicant, this charter school applicant, the Sarasota STEM Academy. My name is Natalie Roca, and I will be serving as the chairperson and facilitator today. This is a public meeting and will be videotaped and recorded. As a courtesy, please silence your phones and electronic devices. So welcome and thank you for coming. We have, uh, we've had a delay in the start time because of a traffic accident and we are still waiting for another member, two more members of the, of the Sarasota STEM Academy team. I will be reading the script so that I cover everything and we follow our standard protocol. This interview session is scheduled from 9 to 10.30, but we do have time at the end, so we'll be able to adjust our time frame. I will take about 10 minutes to describe the capacity interview process and go over a few format details. Then we'll ask the CRC members to introduce themselves, and then I'll turn it over and have you guys introduce yourselves, um, and we'll get started. We've allocated about 60 minutes to 70 minutes for the interview and question and answer period. And at the very end, we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions of us, and we'll talk about the next steps after today. Okay. Right. So as you know, we mentioned you were the same. You were here last week for with our school board members. And so for the public record, you know, our CRC has spent a considerable time reviewing and analyzing your written application. And we also reviewed your written responses that you turned in to us last week. Both individually and collectively, we've devoted over 50 hours to the review process, so we take it very seriously here and have, you may have noted from our comments, we read everything uh, all the way through the attachments uh, because I don't have anything else to do. No, I'm just doing it. So the capacity interview is a very component part of the evaluation process. I know most counties have one. Um, some counties don't. We've been doing it for a long time. We feel it's a very essential piece of the review process. It allows the CRC to probe questions probe questions and substantive concerns raised by the application, also to do due diligence. We're able to corroborate information that you've provided in the written application, and we're able to evaluate the capacity of both the governing board and, in this case, the management company. So today we're going to follow up and vet and probe and reevaluate. <laughs> Please be assured that our reviewers will be thorough, but respectful and open-minded, and we will not provide any technical assistance or give any recommendations today. We will also focus on those areas of the application that we feel are the most essential. Obviously, there's no time to go through every single standard, so we're, you'll see that we will go around and uh, take turns, but also the, the committee members are free to um, have follow-up questions and probe further. You'll also notice that in some cases, our questions will go across standards. We'll have some scenarios um, so that we may ask a question about ELL students as it pertains to instructional materials, as it pertains to a program, so that we have a better idea of how your school is going to operate. We, because we do have a lot of topics to cover, I may interject or otherwise limit your response only so that we are time sensitive and are able to get through all of the pertinent parts of today's capacity interview. And Judy in the back will help me to, she'll be our timekeeper and she'll be waving signs as we go through this to make sure that we um, manage our time wisely. And also because the charter contract, as you know, will be between the sponsor, Sarasota County Schools, our school board members, and the school's governing board. Board, we do expect to hear primarily from the governing board. Hopefully your members will arrive. Um, so obviously we expect to hear from e the um, um, ESP or management company, but <clears throat> we do want to hear primarily from the governing board. Excuse me. So now we're going to begin with introductions from our distinguished CRC panel. Tammy, we'll start with you. Hi, good morning. I'm Tammy Castles. I'm the <laughs> Exceptional Student Education Supervisor. Welcome. 
Hello, I'm Al Hereda. I'm an uh, employee relations and equity administrator in human resources. Tari Tamash Newell, principal of Sarasota School of Arts and Sciences. Good morning, I'm Krista Kurtner and I'm in the budget department. Mitzi Corcoran, chief financial officer. Natalie Roca. Katrina Ward. I'm the, oh. Good morning. I'm Katrina Ward. I am the supervisor in charge of school choice and charter schools. I work very closely with all of our district charter schools, I'm serving as the district's liaison, and I look forward to this process. Good morning. My name is Jamie Rodriguez. I am the ESOL and migrant supervisor for the district. Welcome. Hi, Rabbi Elaine Glickman. I'm the community member for the CRC. Good morning, Sue Meckler, Director of Curriculum and Instruction for Middle Schools. Okay, all right. <clears throat> and we do we do appreciate that you're here. We know it takes a lot of time and effort and expertise to um, propose to open a school, and we know it's a very important process, so we do appreciate the time that you've put into it and being here today. So with that, I'll turn it over, and when you introduce yourselves, if you can give us, um, um, describe for us your relationship and your role with this, with this school. Thank you. I'm uh, Fabio Lopi, I'm a board member, and um, I have uh, participated in the development, obviously, of the application. And um, Welcome. thank you. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be, be here and answer your questions. My name is Frank Bolaños. I'm part of the management company, Alliance uh, Education Services. My uh, background includes uh, really a lifetime of uh, community service in many uh, organizations serving on boards of directors of many community water organizations focused on education both in the K-12 as well as in the higher education field. My experience includes having been a school board member and chairman of the school board in Miami-Dade County, which I, I think um, in this process and other processes that have been involved uh, brings the group the, the viewpoint of the authorizer, brings the uh, group the viewpoint of knowing clearly what the uh, very high stakes and responsibilities of the uh, district and the uh, district school board is. So uh, hopefully uh, throughout this process I can uh, bring to bear some of those experiences. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lucas, and um, I'm also with Alliance Education. I am uh, actually, previous to being in education, was a business management uh, major, hoping to, when I was younger, open um, preschools, so always loved being with kids. Um, I got into charter schools almost accidentally. I have four children. My eldest just graduated high school, but she was my hard one out of the four, and I enrolled her into a charter school, and since then, I really kind of fell in love and knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I went back to school for education instead. Um, I've had the opportunity in the past uh, 10 or 11 years to serve as a teacher, um, instructional coach, principal, and managing director. Um, my experience has been with both national and then statewide charter management organizations. And then in the past couple of years, um, realized this is really kind of my passion, what I want to do, wanted to do it locally and do it better or differently than other people do it. And um, kind of create schools that I wish that my four kids had always gotten to go to or I always got to work in where I was but I love what I do my role would be locally here working with business and community members um, parent members and uh, local staff during the school day um, looking at curriculum student scores and continuous improvement that's kind of my wheelhouse in the school thank you, thank you. so um, um, I'm pondering I here since one or two people. Wow, I know because we do, and, and I appreciate your effort to because you have five governing board members or founding board members right now. Mm -hmm. So we we're hoping the other two fellows can join us. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I was. Um, going to start with curriculum and the educational program design because that's really um, the substance of the school and also some financial questions. Um, but maybe I do have some questions also for the management company and so maybe I'll start with those and hopefully by then your other colleagues will have arrived. Um, as you recall from last week's discussion with our school board members, some of our board members were concerned about the uh, independence of the board as you know relates to the management company and also 
also the uh, the current entity that's submitting the application. And the reason um, there was, and we've also asked you for clarification in the our written um, questions, and you have responded to some of those questions. But I want you to know the reason it was confusing is because you know across the years in the charter school industry, um, you see the same names and the same players, and we know it's everything's legal. No one's accusing anybody of anything. But the 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 reason we were asking is that um, at one point in time, the International School of Excellence was operating, um, and it had Mr. Bolaños, you were the registering agent, and that was way back in 2013-14. And then, of course, more recently, it's the International School of Excellence, comma, Florida, and I know that's the entity that's submitting this application. And... Um, our board members were very concerned about that school that has a, is a D school in Osceola. And the perception um, is that perhaps there has been, uh, you know, there's a separation now between different organizations and that school. And we recognize that the Osceola school that's a D has a different management company. Um, the What's confusing is that Avant Garde, I know there's Avant Garde Foundation, there's Avant Garde Academy Inc., um, a lot of different entities with the same names. And that's what's confusing to the public. So I'm gonna ask questions that are very late person kind of questions. I'm not an attorney. I wish I was, but I'm not. Um, only because they pay better. So uh, I know that Mr. Bolaños, you submitted the application for both schools in Osceola. So that's why, you, and I know that you're not a board member, and we've seen that the boards um, across the different schools have joint meetings. Because we've seen in the meeting, in the minute of the meetings, where they're talking about OBT, which is the Orange Blossom Trail School, which is the D School. They're talking about the Kissimmee School or Kissimmee. And so we see that. And we see that it's very, very clearly noted that, and we see the same names. We see Justin Matthews. We see your name, Ms. Lucas. We see, so we see all of the same names, um, even though I know it's very clear that these are board members or these are just other people present and reporting. So that's why we were concerned that we didn't see any reference to that original school, even when you go through the worksheet and you go back five years. So that was something that our board picked up on. And just for transparency's sake and to be clear to the public and the taxpayer, we wanted to make sure that that was clarified. And I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> thank you. It's appropriate for me to answer because I'm kind of part of the original group that, that created things this way. And, and a, a lot of the, uh, in, in great part, the way that the Avant Garde Academy schools uh, have developed have not been through uh, creation so to speak a lot of the ways that they've developed is in response to a community need in response to members of the community coming and saying uh, we really would like for you to consider opening a charter school in our community and that's really how the first school in Osceola uh, started which is the North uh, Osceola school that's referred to as the uh, OBT or Orange Blossom Trail that's the uh, road where it resides uh, that school uh, really started with um, the board members that, that I knew from uh, Osceola County when I was on the Miami-Dade County School Board. <laughs> we, as you say, it's a, it's a large industry, but a small world. So uh, that that is a high-needs community. It's a community where our schools there serve a population that's about 85% um, um, free and reduced lunch and about 90% minority. So it's uh, really a community that oftentimes those other charter schools that I, and I, I do not mean uh, this in a very negative way, but just as a, um, as a way to characterize, it's not a uh, Starbucks community where so many other charter schools tend to want to go into communities with very high socioeconomic uh, backgrounds and where students have a very rich and oftentimes strong educational foundation. Uh, those, those schools were open in communities where when uh, the avant-garde came in, uh, the charter, other charter schools did not want to go into those communities. Uh, when I started with the founding, uh, supporting the founding board, I started at that OBT uh, school just as a co-founder. I then kind of became involved in other areas that the school needed, um, a business manager, uh, a janitor, <laughs> pest control. Uh, the, and then later uh, in the evolution of uh, opening up a second uh, and third school, uh, the board asked me to serve as executive director. Uh, 
uh, of the schools. So it's been kind of like like an evolution, and that's why it's not a clear line, as you may oftentimes see with other management companies and perhaps other um, uh, charter schools, because the, the, what we really want to do is we want to support uh, individuals in their own community that want to open and run a charter school and be that uh, support function of uh, back office, of, of applying the learnings that we've gotten from other schools and not having to start everything from scratch. So my relationship with that uh, OBT, which is the first avant-garde school, is uh, as a co-founder, as somebody that lends support, uh, lends advice, but not part of the management company. Uh, the, the different corporate entities that you see is in great part driven by the desire of many school districts that their boards be local boards. So it used to be, and some large management companies still kind of fight this trend, it used to be you could have one board statewide, and some charter management companies have had, and still many, many of them have one board that perhaps are overseeing 10, 20, 30 schools. But the, the recent trend is for districts such as yours to want local boards for many good reasons. So that's why when we've got into a new community like the uh, Tampa West Chase community, it's, uh, it's with a new board, which is the International School of Excellence. When we apply here, it's with a new board and a new corporation, which is International School of Excellence Florida. So that's why it begins to get a little bit more complex in that direction. The Avangard Academy Foundation is an entity that I serve as a co-founder. Um, um, it's an entity where I'll, I'll be removing myself as co-founder as other, as we entice other community leaders to, to get involved. And you, you, you oftentimes have to kind of get it started for somebody to be willing to jump in and then continuing. So uh, I expect within the next 30 days that I'll, I'll take a step back from that, continue to support it, and that is a fundraising arm. That's a fundraising component to, uh, to support affiliated schools. Does that help answer the question? Yes, thank you. And I hope you can understand why the questioning, because no, it was just by omission stood out in the worksheet, um, especially with it's so easy to see that you were the co-founder, you submitted the application, and it's the reason that worksheet is there so that the public can see the different relationships. Um, so it was our belief that your name probably should have been listed for five years ago as, as perhaps just a co-founder, but I'm glad that you were able to clarify it. Thank you. Yeah. And, it, and again, it may, it may have to do the, may have a lot to do with the way that the question was, was interpreted mm -hmm. because I, I believe if I recall correctly, the, the question uh, asked for a, a direct uh, relationship, but, but I understand. Right. And in, in, in the, um, no, and we understand it, that it's not part of the management company. I believe that worksheet allows anybody associated with the application to list their name and how you're associated with that. It could it. have been that you were a principal five years or maybe the janitor five years ago. True. So we were expecting to see your name um, with that school, perhaps as co-founder mm -hmm. as it's listed Understood. here. Okay, thank you. thank you. And speaking of local board members, mm -hmm. I believe you have someone who has arrived in joined you. Would you please introduce yourself? I'm Patrick Scully. Um, I worked in charter schools for my whole career teaching. I'm the dean of students in a charter school down in Naples, Florida right now. I also have ties with Sarasota because I my home address is in Sarasota. My parents live here and I come back here a lot. Um, I started in Manatee County and then down in Collier County. Uh, I four charter schools. Uh, I prefer them because I see the difference from my having a bad in internship in public schools and going to charter schools where it's a f close knit family working at a bigger charter school now to a smaller one it's a difference too um working at a school that it's like corporate and then like these guys working at a smaller one it's much different and coming together as a family and working together instead of people you know you only see the owners of the company once a year even if but having a smaller management company you see them coming in more often same as my charter school down in Naples Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Meckler and she's going to ask a few questions about your educational design and uh, curriculum and perhaps student progression. Yes. Thanks. So good morning and thank you for being here today. Um, as we know, literacy, of course, is the foundation of all learning and your application certainly addressed um, in attachment D the layout for the reading block for elementary grades. 
Um, my question is really related to your middle school plan. So for level one and two students um, attending your school as middle schoolers, I noticed that you said you would use the K-12 reading plan of our district, but I would really like you to describe in detail the structure and components of that middle school reading course for these students, including progress monitoring and the actual resources that will be used. Um, I can help answer that question and um, Patrick can jump in as well. Um, for sometimes the sake of even simplification, it's easy for me to say in one of the other schools we're participating in because it's a similar um, program and um, a, a really large middle school there. Uh, the number one thing, of course, is to know where the students are when they're coming into you because they're all going to have different needs. And specifically answering your question on your level one or level two readers is um, knowing where those, those kids come in between um, previous scores and also our baseline assessments that we do. Um, we have currently our students, they are doing a double block of reading, so they're taking back to back reading and English language arts. Um, in the past couple years, specifically in Broward County, that's changed where you're not required to have a double block as long as you're providing the interventions and the actual remediation for students. Um, for us, the goal would be to be fluid. I know that we have, um, I think that what we identified, unless there's a different adoption, is moving into um, journeys and using edge and inside as intervention and support materials for the students who need it. Um, we have a very strong understanding of the overall MTS process and supporting students that need it um, after school reading support and camps not just for um, credit recovery but actually for your at-risk and struggling students so for us for those level one and twos is to really perform the diagnostics and find out why are they struggling where's their deficiency how many years back does it go and making sure that that's what we're actually addressing inside the classroom um, using state adopted uh, core text and then using all kinds of supplemental materials materials as well. Um, we've looked into Achieve 3000 as one example of an additional platform that has um, leveled readers outside of uh, scholastic reading inventory and high interest, high interest text for those struggling readers. So I think that the schedule is um, going to be dependent upon how many kids enroll at, at what levels they are and there's always an understanding that it has to be a little bit fluid to meet the actual needs of your population and figure from there how many students are ones and twos and how do you best utilize your reading endorsed teachers to make sure that they're able to meet their needs um, in addition to that our goal in the application and our goal in the mission of the school is that reading is across all content areas using social studies and sciences to help support um, those reading strategies. Um, many years ago when this first became a push, I was actually a part of that initial MTSS found, um, grant found, founding uh, framework and in um, Imagine North Manatee, which is where I was a principal at a time, we had a very struggling population in the middle school. Elementary looked completely different than what our middle school kids look like. And um, I had sent each one of our middle school teachers to go through the, at the time, CAR PD for content area reading. And we put a very strong um, reading a program into place across all content area where they shared vocabulary. We worked on word origins and some of the basics and, you know, founding principles, word walls came back, you know, for middle school grade levels, um, things that kind of fall by the wayside in middle school. But then you realize good teaching is good teaching, no matter what grade and age kids are. Um, those are some of the strategies that they still need. So uh, my number one goal would be to have strong on-site school leadership and certified and reading endorsed teachers that actually know what they're doing, um, identify PD for them when they need it, and to build an appropriate schedule based on what those kids' needs are. How many minutes, what are the strategies, what is the supplemental materials that go with an actual core reading program? So I think that was one of the challenges I had in looking at the application is there were a plethora of resources mm -hmm. mentioned there. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to grapple with mm -hmm. exactly how you would potentially use all of those various resources that were listed. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, cost prohibitive, right. potentially, and more about, you know, what actually are you going to use for diagnostic and progress monitoring? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say for the diagnostics, our goal is to use iReady. And I mean, we've come out of 
using FAIR all of the time. I mean, FAIR was the big one. And then um, there are some schools that are still using FAIR more for their struggling readers because those are the ones that you can actually pinpoint those deficiencies still through FAIR. And then you see POMS and the FCRR for, you know, additional um, resources. Um, we did move in Broward County where we are utilizing FAIR um, only one time initially using it as an additional diagnostic because it's free and it's available and it's there for you, um, but using iReady as a diagnostic tool and working off of there um, and using the supplemental materials to the core, which is, I'm pretty sure, edge and inside, depending on what grade level the students actually are. So SRI and Achieves then would not be part of that. Those are just some that we've looked into because okay. you, you can't you can't do five or you can't exactly. do five or six. <laughs> exactly. So you have to pick the best one. Right. Achieve, we started to look into depending on the population because they have a really strong intervention materials, ESE and ELL. And so if we open up a school and you have five or 10% ELL, you don't really need to invest in something like Achieve because it's really expensive unless you need the site license for all of those supplemental materials. So yes, I understand you can't use all of them, but I think it's fair to say that we've researched multiple and understand that it's driven by your actual population. How many do you have? Okay. What makes the most sense? All right, thank you. Let me um, go on to my second question here. So your application also states that you will use our student progression plan. Mm -hmm. um, my question is regarding how will course selections be made for your incoming students, um, specifically for middle school, and how will you address the middle school acceleration components of both the school and district's grade? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you wanted to take to Sure. Is that okay? Do, uh, sure. For tag teaming? Absolutely. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. okay. So FSA is our main test that we have to look at as our baseline data. So like for middle school, the FSA for Algebra 1, if you scored a 3 or above um, in 7th grade, you're going to have to take um, Algebra 1 the Oh, I'm sorry, let me step back. In seventh grade, if they score a three or above in their math course on F FSA in math, they're going to have to take Algebra 1 in eighth grade, according to the state. So with that, just taking that baseline from FSA and see what courses they're going to take. And also, there, I mean, FSA is one snapshot of their kids' testing. So also what they're doing in class and the IREADY diagnostics, we can, you know, put the kids accordingly into their classes that they need and accelerate them. So if I hear you correctly, your middle school acceleration plan would be grade eight algebra one for students who scored a level three or above as a seventh grader on the FSA in math. That would be one of the courses. So it's going to be more courses. Um, IB, right? Yes, sorry. At, for, for readiness. I, I right. think it depends, I guess, on the number of students that you have. I mean, I think it's similar to the reading question of knowing um, who comes in, students in middle school taking civics and understanding what the plan is. It's slightly different county to county, but overall statewide, the goal is to get kids college and career ready by high school. So for me, it's more a matter of reverse engineering, is taking a look at where do you want them to be when they're ready for ninth grade, and then working backwards on what they need to take and where they were at fifth grade grade um, coming into you if they're ready for regular like English language arts classes or if they need to take level one and two re, uh, remediation, um, moving students into um, civics, and then also having accelerated classes for math and for science. So I, I want to clarify what my question was specifically. Oh. Related to acceleration courses that count for your school grade mm -hmm. and our district grade, which courses would you be offering for middle school students? Uh, Civics and algebra, for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to questions about finance and budget. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I had the first question was. Um, we didn't receive any responses regarding the ESP questions or on the facilities questions on page 39 regarding um, Building Hope. Um, so could you explain um, to the group the relationship between Building Hope, Charter School Beneva LLC, AES, and STEM? Specifically, we could not decipher who will legally own the land and the improvements once they're made where the school will be sited, and who will be legally obligated for the debt for this site. 
Uh, I can probably answer part of that question. And um, I know we have a representative from Building Hope to answer some of that because that's their strength and what is their um, wheelhouse. Um, my understanding is Beneva, I think you said LLC, is who currently owns the property, will be developing the property and leasing it to the school. So the school will be a lease tenant. Um, probably with a 20-year lease like most schools do, with the goal that after three years of clean audits and building up a reserve, at some point the school would be able to possibly bond out and actually own its own property. So the management group or nobody else has anything to do with land ownership, doesn't own it, isn't planning on buying it out, owning it, or, or doing a lease to the school. So it's an independent owner completely. Um, that's what I can answer as far as the ESP related to the ownership. The school will be a tenant until it is able to, if ever, buy itself out and own the building and build its own reserve. Okay, so the expectation is is that the owner will be the one issuing debt to build the site. I think that's the right answer, yes. Okay. Um, so the only other question I really had was um, with, with regard to having enough built up reserve mm -hmm. um, within three years. Um, in your response on page 45 with regard to ESD students that were being served for mm -hmm. um, VPK, you responded that the 90 students were general education students. So as such, uh, with that response, I have to ask why did these 90, si 90 students be included in your FEFP funding revenues? Um, unless they're ESE, it's my understanding they're not eligible for FEFP funding. So that would actually reduce your revenues by 680000 So mm -hmm. when you include mm -hmm. that revenue reduction on top of the referendum revenues of 714000 it actually takes your budget in year one from a positive 300000 mm -hmm. to a deficit of over a million dollars in mm -hmm. year one. So my concern with that is, is I, I'm not anticipating with a million dollar deficit that you would be buying a building anytime soon, right. but just the ability to meet your op operating obligations I mean what is the plan for that um, so I'm not personally in charge just of the budget but I can say that if the VPK revenue was included in there then the VPK expenses and other things were there so I don't know it's the exact match of if VPK revenue was pulled out then we'd have to pull expenses that are tied to that out at least to some degree right but I'm not the accountant um, also I know if we were I think that there is a few hundred thousand like you said um, identification for contingency so if the referendum goes away we would be able to rework the budget. I think that the most important thing is maybe the school doesn't get there in three years, but it takes five years. We understand that that would be the goal is to reduce or change what our staffing model is or how much we are looking to buy or debt service on FFE and T. Um, but I don't know if anybody else, I don't know if you guys want to answer a question. I understand what you're saying on the ESC piece of the VPK though. It's really separate revenue, a separate actual complete budget of how that's funded and what that looks like. And I I've been in other charter schools, and you have two separate sets of books. One is your VPK section, and one is your overall ed program. Yeah, I guess my my concern is more mm -hmm. um, from, from an audit aspect. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if you're a million dollars negative in the hole, you don't right. have a positive fund balance, there's a going concern issue as right. far as an audit would be concerned. So right. That would well, on the rent, the only other thing I'll say, in, and that is the one, um, you know, a really good benefit of working with Building Hope, where we had talked about the lease um, payment and the actual dollar figure is tied to the number of students. So it may be shown collectively there to give an overall picture of the school budget. That I know that they have to be completely separate. Um, but with minus those VPK students, if we didn't have any VPK students and that funding wasn't there, then the lease is tied to the total number of actual K through six in year one K through eight students that are actually enrolled. Okay. I did, I did want to add that as I look at the uh, calculator, it, uh, as it uh, looks at the number of students and the funding per student, it starts out with uh, on line 11, 101 basic K3. So the calculator itself does not seem to be including that BPK, but, in, but, and I, but I do see that in other areas when, when you look at the enrollment table, it's all grouped in, so I, I understand the, where the question is coming from. Thank you. No, it's in the revenue. It is in the revenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's at, in, the, it's it's the, it's at the bottom. It's your total 714, right. which includes the 90 VPK. Can you repeat? 
It is in the revenue because your yeah. total is 714, and the 90 of that is in the 714, so it's included in the revenue estimation. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it may not be a million dollars in the whole, right. whole. I understand you won't have teaching units right. for VPK if you don't offer VPK um, or if it's not funded, but right. um, the 714000 of lost re uh, referendum revenue already takes you in the hole, so that would be the biggest concern. Mm -hmm. And um, Mitzi, I'd like to add to that that um, the initial application said that your average teaching salary would be 40000 and then you resubmitted, um, changing the numbers to Tier 1, 42 to 46, 46 to 52 for Tier 2, and 52 to 60 for Tier 3, mm -hmm. also adding um, supplements for master specialists. Mm -hmm. So that would also change your overall um, mm -hmm. budget, I would say, with, um, with that being added, with that being changed from right. the original budget that was submitted. <clears throat> One clarifying question about the um, facilities in your application under the 16, you know, section 16 with facilities, it says AES has negotiated a purchase and sale agreement for the eight acres, blah, blah, blah. So you've negotiated this sale agreement on behalf of the uh, governing board? Right, and I would say worked worked with them to make sure that the actual a dollar figure is tied to student enrollment, not just one flat you know revenue fee. And worked with them on what does the price to the school cost because if the school does not even open with enough kids, that really does need to get mm -hmm. renegotiated so that the school mm -hmm. is not opening up at a deficit. Okay, and I think a lot of times um, people just sign on the dotted line and at really high fees, and then they realize that they're in a problem before they even hit day one on operating costs. All right, and then one, one more question too. We had asked you about the number of students that are anticipated, and we mentioned the 1,400 you know figure, and I know you clarified not. Right. And the only reason we did that is because we looked at the um, the community meeting mm -hmm. um, that you engaged in with the city for the property, and that's where that figure came up. Right. So we didn't just pull it out of thin air, and that's why we wanted clarification. Yeah, thanks. Do you want me to do that again? Because we talked we, about it very briefly last week. Yeah, we did that last week. Uh, yeah, I can I can uh, clarify for the meeting that that initial calculation was based on the acreage and and the um, the land available. Mm -hmm. And then as you go a little bit deeper into the development process and the zoning and approvals process, we, we know that the issues of stacking of water retention and all that come mm -hmm. into play. Mm -hmm. So usable land is oftentimes reduced. Also, so that that application for a zoning uh, perspective really reflected what was the maximum number of student seats that uh, was believed at the time that the site could actually hold, not necessarily what the application comes to you would look like. All right, thank you, understood, thank you. Um, just, just quickly, um, you had said that you had nothing to do, uh, the management company didn't have anything to do with the relationship, but it just said that you negotiated the purchase and sale agreement. So it's not the rental agreement mm -hmm. for the school to pay rent. It right. sounds like the purchase and sale of the property, which is charter school Beneva, Beneva. LLC. Right. Uh, I think it, I think that the the term the PSA is is really incorrect. It's going to be a lease that we help to negotiate on behalf of the board. That PSA was put together by the groups that are on there outside and irrespective of of us. But when we talked about whether this is a good place for this school, it was dependent upon that works and regardless of what you're buying, as long as the school has a fair and equitable amount of lease that it pays. So I think it's more of the wording and using the PSA, but we were able to at least share with the board, we can work with this group and make sure that it's a fair lease price. We did not negotiate the PSA itself of when it was purchased, which I think was actually probably two or more years ago before we were, I'm not sure, but I think it was even before we were here or invited to be here. Okay. Well, that was yep. part of the reason for the that question was more sense. said you negotiated the purchase. So, okay. Thank you. And you'll notice, as I mentioned um, to you last week when we were leaving and out in the lobby, a lot of our questions are based on the fact that different pieces of the application don't line up, mm -hmm. or there's conflicting information, or values are different. And you heard from our school board members last week that if an applicant proposes to use our K-12 reading plan, our ELL plan, 
student progression, that's fine, but we want to see evidence that you're familiar with that so that you know what you're committing to. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's not apparent. Or conversely, a um, more serious situation is that there is no way you can implement your plan as proposed if you're going to be following our protocol. Mm -hmm. And so there's that disconnect. You'll see a lot of those questions are because of that lack of alignment or disconnect or lack of alignment with the staffing and the budget or the budget and the programs. So again, we're very thorough. Mm -hmm. We we, uh, we require our school, our charter review committee to meet read everything from A to Z as opposed to only specializing in their program area. So, okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tara. We want to talk about your target population and the school choice and other schools that are around that five mile radius that we, uh, you clarified for us is going to be your main focus, but not you're not limiting it to uh, students in that area. Tara? Hello, everyone. Um, primarily, I guess what my question is when we were reading through the application. Uh, was that it had said that there was only uh, one choice within that, that target region, which I'm assuming was uh, SAA, because that's the closest school in that area. However, we're actually, we have, you know, this myriad of options, with this map full of ideas, um, as well as these ones here. So we're, we're pretty flooded in North County. Um, and, you know, there's lots of different options. They're not just traditional schools. We have a magnet school um, in four charter schools, all in this vicinity of, of North County. So uh, my question is not um, necessarily disagreeing with your application or your rationale, it's the location. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the part that I don't understand because I don't see a need, and need is important. You know, we don't want to cannibalize our own schools at that point and not serve the community that needs them, which, you know, even with the growth numbers we were looking at that you guys presented, you know, the three to five percent, mm -hmm. it's almost 100 percent in South County. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at that point, I guess what I need you to do or what I want to ask you to do, because all of these 14 options are public, they are free, they, you know, um, schools to all children, is kind of explain the rationale for the location for me and or if you're only locked to that location or if you're interested in other ones. Um, so that location was identified as a good location because out of Sarasota County Schools, the ones, and there's very few, that tend to struggle more are more in that corridor. Even the um, one of the choice schools that's there, I think, has been a D or a C and, you know, kind of bounces back and forth, um, elementary and middle as well. So I, I live on the southeast side of the county. I know that that's where a ton of growth is. Um, first of all, I wouldn't say that we're 100 percent locked into any one location especially if given the opportunity to to operate a STEM school and you said this is the best place that we, you could actually help out the county and is preferable, um, that's what the goal is. That area, though, gives a couple of those partnerships um, where they logistically make sense. You're closer to Moat Marine than if you were on Southeast side and to the Bobby Jones golf course, which is good for that community. And it offers a STEM program that is different from what the other choice options are there. Even if you were to go, I guess, directly due east towards um, Sarasota Military Academy. And I have, you know, great friends and who work there and families who attend there, um, but it's a totally different population. And our goal was to say it provides equity and access for kids in this very immediate surrounding community that may not have the opportunity for a STEM school or they're not close enough to go to Sarasota Middle that, you know, my kids may go to and they're, you know, experiencing great and wonderful things there, but I don't know that it's the exact same program. So that was a goal of offering to like that immediate community. Um, I understand that there's greater growth in other areas. I think there's transition in and out of that community and they're trying to kind of support that community and rebuild it. They're doing um, more work in some of those um, shopping plazas that are adjacent there and trying to revitalize it to some degree. And I think that a STEM school is good for those kids that may not naturally have had it. So I think when we said there's not a lot of choice schools, it's as specific to our program and with those relationships that we feel are good for kids. Yeah, I do want to add, if I made that in the application of those pages 15 through 19, uh, does, it, does include a lot of detail and a lot of data as to the 
justification or the rationale behind selecting this part of the county. I do understand that certain assertions or assumptions uh, can be disagreed with. So we understand that and that's always something we'll, we'll always be looking at, especially if demographic uh, trends uh, change in the future. Uh, and in, uh, in answer to your question, while, while I believe there are a lot of advantages with the site that's been pre-selected from the point of view that there's probably a good six to eight months of planning and design and zoning work already done and we know that the timeline to open a school each uh, cycle becomes more and more tighter uh, what well, we do believe there's a lot of advantages to uh, continuing with the possibility and prospect of this site uh, it's up to the board the board at any moment in time could decide to look at another site I, you know, I was agreeing with what they were saying, right. especially with the Mode Marine and the Marine Science mm -hmm. Program and mm -hmm. the partners that are close by. And, mm -hmm. and there are certain advantages. And if you remember last time we had discussed the, uh, the, 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 the readiness of the school and making sure that everything was ready. And one of the, one of the comments that I made was that, you know, anything that we could do ahead of time realizing that you know it is still pending mm -hmm. your your approval obviously mm -hmm. uh, but anything that we could do ahead of time or anything that we could organize or we could move forward to be ready and make sure it was ready we would try to do as long as it's within reason and as long as it doesn't you know commit us to a certain Looking. And we appreciate that, especially living in Florida, it's hard sometimes to deal with Mother Nature with construction. Right, exactly. And um, it's the, you know, the facilities folk, their their job was to say, wow, it's a very ambitious schedule. And we would hope that if this continue, goes moves forward, that there would be some adjustments there and more of a, you know, a check with real, a reality check, because we don't want to, I know you experience dreadful things up in Hillsborough County. Nobody wants to go through that Make again. Make that a name of a movie instead of right. hateful things. Yes. <laughs> and then... Um, with the Moat Marine and you know the committee gave you an opportunity mm -hmm. to submit that letter mm -hmm. um, and our concern was not so much the partnership because all of our schools have activities mm -hmm. with Moat Marine we have the Ed Explorer SRQ where we actually have activities with Moat Marine mm -hmm. it was more that it was pervasive through your application mm -hmm. a heavy reliance on them as a resource mm -hmm with the activities with professional development so that was the our concern not so much the partnership it's great we have you know we're so lucky here in Sarasota we have great foundations and partnerships with everything and every kind of content area so we're very fortunate with that so that was it and even even the uh, the letter is still somewhat vague and as Tara knows that we know Moat Marine does charge for certain services and some PD and some activities mm -hmm. so we didn't know if you had accounted for that or if that was also so reflected in your in your budget as well. Tara, do you have anything to add to the Moat Marine? The only thing I would add is she said some, they charge for everything. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so full price. Great program. Mm -hmm. Just wondering because we didn't see that mm -hmm. specifically noted, mm -hmm. even um, the PD courses mm -hmm. the field trips for every single student, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking at ten, fifteen dollars per student per mm -hmm. day. So we didn't we wanted to make sure that that was okay, that that was adequate with the numbers, you know, like for your budget, I think I got down to six twenty now for mm -hmm. year one. You know, and you're looking at these these different variances and then we also don't want to we understand with a management company typically you have that background you have a little bit of a safety net mm -hmm. you know and that's that part's great and at the same time we don't ever want to see a school that's constantly in debt we've seen that with you know another right. school in the district and then it's you can't get out of this hole right so how do you, how are you going to pay for you know like a moat marine which is mm -hmm. wonderful and having a bus and having a right. bus driver and right. gas and fruitville so yeah it does take a while i do car i do car pull up there um uh, so I want to say a little bit about the Moat Marine and the Bobby Jones, which is walking distance, of course. Bobby Jones is easy, and there's really um, almost no cost for that particular program. And with Moat Marine, it's a lot more than just bringing kids there for the field trips. I mean, I taught here in Sarasota School. I know we brought our kids at every grade level. My daughters have been there at every grade level for different things, is to be 
um, more a part of the curriculum and more a part of the program as far as what we offer in hands-on projects and activities. It's not all costly. It's not getting the kids there and they're just experienced, you know, an hour on the bus and, and doing the Moat Marine and coming back and writing about it. So I think that the partnership is slightly different than, you know, what other schools have had. Um, we met with their um, education team on a couple of different, you know, um, occasions and, you know, worked through what some of that would look like of real service learning and community projects phased in mostly on campus through the school. Um, I understand that there was, you know, questions and some um, concerns or pushback also on another partnership we had talked about doing through Riverview um, High School, uh, which was really just very organic in nature of how that came to be, reaching out to a Marine teacher who said, call my principal, who said, oh my goodness, call our AP. They run, you know, bio and environmental sciences here. Um, so it was a very organic conversation where lots of people got excited and field trips there outside of the fuel cost were to be free and to, you know, be able to share resources. And we even talked about, is there grants we can do together where either they have a larger space and can actually house um, environmental things and growing um, things in their fisheries where our kids can experience them and talked about really cutting the cost down by partnering. So that was the goal of those. It's not just for that. Um, PD, there is a line, and I don't know, you know, specifically where it is on the professional development, but a lot of it was PLCs and people working together Together, um, doing vertical alignment and not just <coughs> buying a box product and I know that they are costly but it was kind of broader than that and more specific than that which hopefully would be defraying those costs and more a part of the school as opposed to just going to the to do the field trips and they do cost a lot of money I pay for them as a mom. <laughs> also I'd like to point out that uh, I have children that are in charter schools and uh, and actually, my daughter wants to study marine sciences, and we don't have that option available. And so, I, you know, there's a great value to being able to have them ready for their future, especially sometimes children know what they want right away, and they, they have a feeling for what they want, and they would like to know. So in our case, what we're going to do is, you know, we'll look into option, you know, I mean, it, with my job, I can easily move to Sarasota and, and if, if it's available. But the whole point is that these are things that, that the children want and and if, if they're available and they can study it, then that's even better. So I, I would definitely support that. If, if I may, as the uh, Moat Marine, we're very excited about the, and I'll, I'll add the word potential partnership because in reality, we dedicate, we have de dedicated a lot of time and in, in multiple meetings uh, with the leadership at Moat Marine. And, and perhaps that letter is not reflective of all of that, only because Moat Marine understands perfectly well as we do, that until you approve us, we really can't go any, uh, it doesn't make sense to go much deeper with it, but I, I do understand the questions as to where where does the money come from. The the application process does not allow us, nor would we do so, uh, include fundraising, but that would be a source where a lot of our fund, fundraising prowess and, and abilities would would go to to be able to raise funds to help pay for some of those special programs. Actually, I think there is in one section you you can discuss potential funding raising activities and other sources of funding. It what? may have been a while since you looked at the. It's grown over the years, so <laughs> no. there is a section that that can. No, be but believe me, I, I dream with this application. Yes. Uh, oh, do you? Uh, a, yeah, I spent a lot of time please. myself on it. I yeah. I tell you exactly what's on each page. No, but. what 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 I what I meant to say is that uh, we. We were not supposed to include f fundraising revenues in the budget correct, is what correct, I meant Correct, correct. And before I turn it back to Tara, and again, um, we appreciate the letter and the support, and it's great to anticipate those kind of community partnerships. Our issue, again, was that the, the reference to existing things, and again, the heavy reliance on activities and PD and other kinds of programs that are an important part of your, your academic program. But then in that last, another section, it talks about these things will come into play in year three. So again, a disconnect. It's built in throughout the program, but then, oh, it won't come into play until year three. So 
So um, I think Dan actually really worked on the partnerships, but I think he phrased it more as a three-year phase in where in year one, all the partners are getting to know each other. And by year three, feeling like we were now contributing back to them of having further defined it. Not that it's not expected for year okay. one and two, but that it takes three years for a school to truly you know, right. get its footing, have all of your grade levels there and really implement all of the different pieces that you want. Similar to the curriculum question, mm -hmm. you can't do everything with all brand new kids in year one, but you know, we have to start. Understood, but that's right. not what is in the application. Yeah. Okay. okay, Tara? I just wanted to thank you for your answers and let you know that we we don't disagree necessarily with the rationale for marine science and, and seeing that as a missing component um, per se. We don't disagree with, uh, you know, Moat Marine, they're fantastic. Brad Tanner and his group, they're, they do a wonderful job. Um, just wanting to make sure that it's feasible and, and agree with you as well that Bobby Jones, free. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful. The Riverview field trips, $1, $2 per student, very affordable. Um, we just, the, the reliance upon, you know, a lot of the Moat Marine stuff, even if they're coming to your school running workshops, even if they're doing PD, versus just field trips. Like you said, we go out there, we do water testing, you can spend three days there. Um, it's just making sure that it's feasible, that it's not putting you guys, you know, in, it's not debt inducing. Right. That's all. Right. Wanted to ensure that. And then break the program. My concern, right, you don't want to break the program, of course. You know, you have to, you have to pay for other stuff like electricity too. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just the, the location. I, I, I still, I just still worry about that. I, I don't want, if you're struggling for enrollment, you're struggling for everything now. Right. Thank you. Natalie, may I follow up with Tara's question? Sure. And then I'm going to be the taskmaster. Okay. And get this <laughs> Sorry. Again. So I, I just want to go back to a clarifying question based on what she asked and your response um, regarding location. You alluded to Sarasota Middle School being our STEM school for middle schools. No, I said they have a really great program. Like my daughter, I know what technology that they're using. I didn't say that they're a STEM okay. school. So basically, mm -hmm. all of our middle schools right. have the same access and right. equality as Sarasota Middle School. Right. Booker Middle, McIntosh Middle, Brookside Middle all have those same tech active classrooms. They are all mm -hmm. focused on STEM um, in their schools as right. far as curriculum and instruction is concerned. When I think of the marine science piece of this, again, all of our schools currently have access to those resources, mm -hmm. and we are required by state to offer our students a diverse curriculum. So when it comes to science curriculum, we can't be focused just on marine science. Right. Um, in order for students to progress to high school, they have to have three different science courses. Right. So my question is, how is marine science going to be embedded all three years in your school? Um, so we will embed it in um, throughout the science classes as well as in electives and as well as in writing and math when they're doing measurement and when they are doing investigations and when they're doing data and graphing. The goal is to really infuse it, not to make it this is the only science that we're teaching. We would have all of the core curriculum, all of the core courses for progression, but to infuse it as a theme and as a model. And in kids in kinder and first grade might be working with kids that are in older grades on, I think we touched very briefly on what some of those partnerships were, whether it was growing lettuce for manatees or talking about red tide or whatever is new and whatever is impacting the community. It can be a part of all of their courses. It can be things they're reading about, things that they're writing about with the intention of focusing on it purposefully. So it's not that that's the only science. It's just something that we want to infuse throughout that kids have access to throughout the curriculum, similar to the reading. I mean, you know, content area reading and that's what they like to read. I mean, they love sharks. They love that kind of stuff. So it's more of an anchor, not one course. Okay. Thank you. Just really quickly, Dr. Roca, before you move on, uh, my question is, um, Glenn Wachter mm -hmm. um, was serving as an administrator, pardon me, as an assistant principal at Riverview High School. Right. Um, and you identified him as a board member. He's no longer at Riverview High School. However, will he still serve on your board? Um, I think he has to make that decision. I know he's at Venice. Um, he fully supports the school, of course. He was previously a science teacher and a science major and in environmental sciences, so he loves the idea, love the idea of kids being on campus and sharing that program. Um, he has 
to decide, I guess, you know, being in Venice, if he still is supportive of it and um, has, I think, also reached out to other folks that are retired principals or in the community that are supportive of it. So I can't answer that question for him. Um, he's was fully invested in the a goal and the idea of, you know, putting kids and teachers together and in, in that way. So. And of course, we understand that there's no conflict of interest at all right. to be a, a Sarasota County employee and also serve on, on the board. We yeah. don't understand that. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that uh, we get to questions about serving our ESE students. So, Tammy, I'm going to turn it to you. Okay, so the application narrative really does a good job reflecting a strong understanding of the MTSS process. I just had a, a question about that. Could you please describe your levels two and three behavioral and academic interventions in the MTSS process, and then could you go one step further and explain the identification of a student with a disability? Um, I can, and, and you can. Yeah. I mean, because we're trying to share. I, sure. Thank you. Okay. No, and again, we, we like to hear yeah. from the governing yeah. board members. I, yeah, Thank you. Questions. And which reminds me, is, is Mr., is it Kuhar? Is he going to? He's I'm not sure. I tried to reach out. Oh. I know. And he's the one also with I'll say he was very passionate about right. STEM, right. and Start um, we were school. hoping to continue that conversation. I oh, I, I, I do know that he indicated at the beginning of the week. Uh, he did indicate a little, little bit earlier, uh, towards the end of last week, rather, that uh, he was having some family-related uh, issues. So. Yes. So. Can, can you repeat those questions? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, basically, we'd just like for you to describe the Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions, behavioral and academic that are used in the MTSS process. And then could you go one step further, please, and explain um, how would you identify a student with a disability? With a disability already that's on an IEP or without IEP? You're going through the MTSS right. process. Okay. And then finally, how would you how would you okay. identify a student with a disability? So, um, for behavior, um, you would start with the tier one, your class of PBS, and work with the, the teacher, the kids. And if you notice that, I, a kid's acting out constantly what's the antecedent so we have to go and check with you know look at what's causing this what can we stop for like a kid running away constantly running away okay why is he running away so what are we going to do? Then we have to start a plan for him, a behavior plan, like a, using a chart for a behavior plan and working on it. I mean, start small and then go, I mean, bigger from, you know, the time frame. So we'll start with um, after each assignment, he gets uh, one, two points each assignment and right, make that goal and graph it and, of course, graphing and data tracking. And then if that's not working, keep on going going to more intensifying you know set the goal lower and or higher depends on the kid or how they want to use the graphs or how they use the MTSS process and then if that's still a problem then you bring in a psych and do a psychology um, evaluation okay so what uh, what actual interventions are taking place as far as behavior interventions have you identified certain ones or you are what I hear you saying is you actually are looking to see what the antecedent is and then you collect data and provide more service depending on the way the student responds right because each kid is different so you can't have the same exact um, intervention for the same exact kid because his behavior might be mm -hmm. different from her behavior hers mm -hmm. you know okay. or vice versa okay thank you and I know you touched on the academic mm -hmm. interventions early mm -hmm. could you could you go into a little more detail about the difference between tier two and tier three please um, sure I would say the, the first component of that is the matter of time um, when kids are receiving it how many minutes per day and how often that they actually need it um, really dependent upon once you identify a problem whether it's um, behavioral or academic it could be tardiness. It could be things going on at home um, to try to focus in on what the problem is, um, work with the team to provide solutions. And that would be um, the first thing is we do have in our master schedule an additional 30 minutes of protected time for remediation and um, tier two and tier three. Um, and then we also um, talked about the extended learning program for students after school who needed additional help outside of. Um, so we're not taking them out of their core courses beyond that. 
um, obviously using data monitoring to see what is actually working if students are making progress you keep doing what you're doing and um, you know the goal is to move them out eventually and, and to have them caught up and to close those achievement gaps and after um, a number of weeks if nothing is working you continue to increase their remediation time and then eventually refer them for um, a further evaluation for services um, that could they could end up going either way I mean I've definitely seen kids especially behavioral who you end up doing a psyche eval and then they qualify for gifted and you realize they had all these other things going on too um, so it's more a matter of meeting the kids where they are we have time built into the schedule we have time expected in after school schedule for them and um, working whatever it takes to close the gap okay and this crosses over with the curriculum question I think that Sue asked um, is it are you are you using iReady and how often are you progress monitoring those students and the outcomes and then um, I, what I hear you saying is that you increase the time for remediation depending on that is that okay. correct um, it's correct. All students would have iReady three times a year, baseline, mid-year, and end of year. Um, iReady, though, also has like a diagnostic and instructional core, so not all students may need to do the iReady instruction and diagnostics as often as those that you identify that are actually on a monitoring plan. So um, it gives you that flexibility of how often you do use it and data track versus it, the students that are already on level or above don't need it in the same capacity. Okay. And I have one other question. Um, there's a comprehensive plan that's um, evident for how students with special needs will be served in the least restrictive environment. It's very clear in the application. Um, could you please go into a little bit more detail about the process that you will use to determine the need for a student who is to be instructed using a modified curriculum? And what would his or her instructional day look like? Um, so I would say it's going to, again, vary based on what their IEP is. You know, if we're uh, enrolling a student who's on an IEP and they already have modified curriculum goals and um, specifications in there, then we would implement those, um, make sure the student continues to make progress, and then use our IEP team to meet, bring in the parents and talk about whether the child is meeting goals and needs to stay there. Um, I think it depends on what the level of services are, what, you know, are we contracting out for services that are part of that? Um, are we changing the curriculum? I mean, kids all need to be exposed to grade level curriculum um, and then have it modified for what their actual needs and abilities are. So it's hard to answer that in one blanket <laughs> statement because it could vary so much. But making sure that the entire team is involved and also where the student comes from, um, hopefully whatever school they come from, that the district schools or other choice schools work well on transition meetings and in you know talking about those kids and what's best for them. I mean, that's when you really need to do information sharing and have good relationships with the other schools, too. Okay. Thank you. Right over to Elaine. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, as a community member and um, mother of three children who are all in Sarasota County Schools, um, I, I was just dismayed that there were a lot uh, many parts of the application um, that did not seem to be uniquely created um, for our community and, you know, therefore for my kids um, and for the kids um, you know, in Sarasota. Um, there were a number of pages where clearly things had been copied from another application and there had been search and replace. There were times when um, PTO had clearly been search and replaced over PTA. Mm -hmm. And what was most alarming to me, and I believe it was noted here on page 25 um, in the responses was in attachment G where the word against was rendered as S S A um, I N S T where clearly A G A mm -hmm. had been searched and replaced with S um, with S S A. Um, I, I just wanted to know how you would respond to that and how you would allay mm -hmm. my the concerns that arise from that. This is was not a school, this is not a program that is uniquely created for Sarasota and that it's replicating a school that, you know, might have certain aspects that are not necessarily what I would want and expect for my children. Do you want to answer that? That's a, a thoughtful question, and the 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 foundation of, of the answer is that as we've gone through these very interesting and challenging uh, application processes uh, throughout different years, different uh, uh, districts, uh, we keep learning and we keep improving the educational program that's reflected in our application. So you're right; we don't entirely discard 
a previous program that's been reflected in another application. We do change it, we do adapt it to the local community. And as, as challenging as it is from a, let, let's call it from a logistical point of view, um, and I, I kind of had to chew on that one at the beginning because it does pose uh, problems from a logistical point of view to have a local board, but by virtue of having a local board, it does guarantee that involvement. Um, I challenge anybody to show any other management company whose uh, top level mm, educational person lives in Sarasota County. You don't, you don't get any closer to understanding what the needs of the community are than having your children attend uh, local schools in that community. Your, your question is a very valid question, uh, and, I, and I do want to uh, add to that, if I may. I do want to add to that, that as we go through this process, uh, we get feedback, we get critique, and it, uh, it is used by the board to provide direction as to let's go deeper, perhaps, into a particular need of the community and some of the other components that may, that, that may make the program more attractive to, to, to folks that are looking for something like that. I understand, and I certainly agree with everything you're saying, but what I'm saying is that's not reflected in the application. Were that reflected in the application, then when you found that, oh, these things haven't really worked in AGA, we need to make sure that we update and make them better for SSA, you wouldn't just have copied and pasted that and just, you know, left um, and left those letters in. And also I write and I edit, um, and it just, it shows a certain, it just shows a certain lack of respect, I feel, that the application wasn't proofread, mm -hmm. that those things weren't noticed. It wasn't, it wasn't obviously even fully spell-checked um, or gone over with the same attention um, that we gave. And I just want to say that, that that was a concern to me, and I appreciate what you've said, um, but it hasn't fully allayed my concerns. Thank you, though. And don't worry, we're not going to charge you for our editorial services. <laughs> so, which reminded me of something else, because um, you did clarify for us that this STEM, the Sarasota STEM, is not the same as the avant-garde program. I mean, obviously, there are some similarities. You're going to capitalize on things that have worked. We, we get that. The Manatee application that I know you withdrew, but um, it was called the Avant-Garde Academy. And we know we actually went through and checked page by page, because we're you know, twisted that way. And the bulk of it is the same. So it's hard to say that, well, this, you know, this new organization, this new entity with the Sarasota STEM Academy, um, it's totally different, different entity with a different program when it's very obvious that it was pretty much the same program and intent with the exception of the STEAM. And even in our application, you can see the STEAM and STEM going back and forth. So again, that was a little bit concerning to us, especially to community and parent member when they saw that so it's difficult on one hand to say oh it's different here and that's why it's not an avant-garde school when you see that the bulk of the program is the avant-garde school and it goes back to some of the performance indicators of other avant-garde schools that our board members don't have the assurance that it's a different program and therefore our track record is either not established yet or it's on the right track so just to emphasize that yeah I do think that uh, the change from steam to stem is a major change and it's a major change change reflective of what we've identified and been told to be a major need in this community. We also do believe that the addition of the marine science component with MOAT and some of the other partnerships is a major change uh, in the application and the uh, educational program of it. And I, I do want to add that there certainly was no desire to uh, show any disrespect uh, if any of these typos um, uh, occurred in the application. Thank you. Okay, and you, you do realize that STEAM is still throughout the application, just so I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. correct it for, all right, thank you. Um, Jamie, are you ready to pose some questions about our ELL students? Good morning. I'm Jamie Rodriguez, the Soil and Migrant Office, and um, I would like you, if you can please um, kind of guide me through a class, a STEM class, where the teacher has to plan for their ELLs in the classroom. How would that look like and what does the teacher need to do? You want to take some of that in? As a teacher, for planning for ELL, you have to make sure, you have to see, you know, it depends where they're from, Spanish or Vietnamese or a different language, or not from, but the language. Um, you have to see what the kid knows already. 
and then when you start planning you got to make sure you have in your visuals for sure with your um, so they have that visuals sometimes some te I see some teachers working using cognates Spanish cognates into their lessons so the Spanish speakers um, can use those Vietnamese is kind of um, depends what area but it's some teachers have Vietnamese students so they try to it's more difficult for them to get there but they do the research to find out what to do for them um, for Spanish and since it's becoming um, more of a population down in Florida here um, I'm a minority so obviously it's taking classes to understand Spanish and translating for the students too for um, those teachers the teachers also can do um, pull the text in Spanish because there's several places where you can get the same text in Spanish and have the English and Spanish in front of you too I can I can add just a little bit um, to that um, really only from my experience I mean language it depends on where you live what language they are and really what their entire culture is and means of learning which is different and I think your question also was specific to migrant because we there is a quarter yes of, of well, language not so much migrant Mi more the east so we, okay. our migrant population is okay. very small here. yeah I, very, I was going to uh, say it's much larger in Manatee we had yeah. a pretty we had a really large um, so sometimes attendance itself was a problem and getting kids you know to and from and, and then they would transition out midway through the year um, so with the ESOL students it's similar to the ESE is you know determining um, what their language classification is how much of a gap there is as far as are they in language acquisition and you're first actually teaching language as opposed to um, what the content is and um, m making sure that the teachers understand what those additional strategies are whether they include visual um, picture cards and dual language dictionaries dual language um, parent notifications is really important to make sure parents can support it at home um, from the stem perspective I think it depends on you know what you're teaching for some kids whether you're um, ESOL or not there it's a new topic so everyone's kind of learning that at the same time um, and there's a lot of hands-on engagement I think it's actually good for kids to have those opportunities but certainly knowing what their language is knowing what the deficiencies are what strategies would be appropriate for them and what additional supplemental curriculum you have to have available for them to be able to connect um, would be the first thing you said you will follow the um, Sarasota plan, ESOL plan. Mm -hmm. We do not, uh, our target, we teach in the target language, we mm -hmm. teach in English. We don't use supplemental uh, bilingual mm -hmm. materials versus costly, unless right. the teacher has time to be looking for it on the internet. And uh, secondly, um, when it comes to planning, my question was, I didn't hear anything, nor did I see anything about these Florida adopted ESOL mm -hmm. standards that the teacher needs to um, use in their planning, and there is a whole WIDA mm -hmm. philosophy so where, where it shows you, helps you with um, planning for your ESOL students. So that, I didn't, I didn't mm -hmm. even see that at all. Anything related to the WIDA standards? You didn't make mention of the state standards for ELA and right. math, but when it came to the WIDA ESOL standards and teacher planning, I didn't see that in the. Right. No. So, and, and right now, what you're sharing, I, I didn't hear that either. Right. I understand what you're saying as far as including the specific standards just for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Then I do have another uh, question, which is more programmatic. Um, this question has to do with uh, also, you did mention WIDA in your once, and it had to be about assessment. Right. Now, can, knowing, saying that you're going to be using our plan, can you tell me what, um, how you identify your ESOL students and what assessments you use? Because there are diff different assessments. WIDA yeah. is not an assessment. Um, so we had used, uh, well, your, your first indicator is the home language survey. I mean, when students are coming in and if they're checking the home languages to utilize. Now, for us, not having been in Sarasota County before, every county is different as far as either what assessment that they prefer to you to use or if they offer it to you. Some some counties, you know, you use the same that they have. So if we to access in other counties is their primary first tool for um, language classification or identification and then SELA 
I think so in Hillsboro we were using different things than what Broward is using um, those are the only other places that I've personally worked where we did an IPT in Broward County initially so you do your initial placement um, it's changed and changes every year if they're online and if they're through uh, elevation plan and things like that so we would have an ESOL facilitator though and work with the district and find out exactly which is the preferred initial placement and then ongoing for assessment okay since you did say you were going to follow our ELL mm -hmm. plan I would mm -hmm. imagine you probably read it and right. had some idea of what our plan is to say you're going to follow that right well so we're just missing Dan who was those were one of his sections and we really did divide up and conquer you know who was going to manage you know a reading curriculum section and different pieces okay. of it and I think he had followed up on some of the progression stuff but okay Thank you. I can't say I'm anyone's one expert in everything. That's why there's 12 mm -hmm, of right. you, and everyone specializes right. in something. No, and absolutely, nobody, that's nobody one of the can know every for is diversity. I, in yeah, the so I'm okay saying like, that's not right. my wheelhouse. Like reading right. and MTSS is, you know, mm -hmm. I'm there on your wheelhouse. But. No, absolutely, and that's why we did see that uh, your governing board members, you do have a wide and, right. and diverse set of experiences, and that's something yeah. commendable and specialists. In right and right. right, exactly, and that's why and, we were hoping for, right. you know, um, more representation and especially with uh, Dan uh, was I was we wanted to follow up on his um, discussion about STEM because he right. said he wasn't able to articulate his um, STEM program because we wanted to see how is it different from Sarasota County STEM we have you know uh, classrooms of tomorrow with a lot of technology started like six years ago and um, anyway so maybe we'll look yeah. forward to talking to him at some other point right his that I think sold us just for the record is and his um, founding school was in, in Hawaii and again that's a really hard demographic I mean mm -hmm. they can barely get kids to school it's very mm -hmm. very low socioeconomics and problems but um, it's it's mostly the hands-on and infusing it throughout the day and it's not one course and it's not one box shop mm -hmm. or one field trip but it's a part of life and using you know he's very hands-on with the environmental science piece and physical science mm -hmm. piece I wish he was here as well to mm -hmm. handle that section of it and how they did it because of the language barrier also there and working in multi mm -hmm. but and as you know, I mentioned to you last week that um, our committee, you know, we're tied to the application to the state standards. We have to use the state's tool, and we have to follow the criteria. So sometimes it is frustrating, or perhaps maybe there are aspects of your program that are not captured in the application. And as as you've heard our committee members talk about, well, that's not what's here, or it's not really flushed out. It's lacking detail, or in some cases, you know, contradictory. So anyway, um, let me see, make sure, did I get, does anybody else have a burning question or Katrina, are you okay or? I, well, Cause we have maybe just a, like three minutes left okay, for questions. Really so in the application, um, there, were, there was no mention of your dismissal procedures. And inevitably, there will be one student um, that will, it just won't be a good fit. Mm -hmm. So what I would like to know, maybe you could describe or explain your dismissal procedures, and if you could also include um, due process that would be available to a parent in the event there they don't agree with the, the decision to dismiss. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you're talking about exiting a student who's not a good fit for your school. We call it dismissal. <laughs> Is this we don't we don't exiting? we don't call it revoking reassignment or reassignment. Yeah, we're not we call doing it any dismissal. of those things. Um, yeah, that's hard. I think that uh, I think that sometimes parents will help you and come to that decision that it's not a good fit for their child. Um, the due process is I do not know off the top of my head someplace in the appendixes of 190 something of um, due process for parents to actually come and meet first with school leadership and with the board and to follow a regular due process procedure. Um, the policies of the governing board which change when you reassess them every year are there. Um, for students it would definitely be a more matter of referral tracking, how many times, what are the consequences and understanding are they, you know, is it just bad behavior that this student can't figure out or is it actually a school safety issue? I mean, there's a huge difference when students are unsafe for the environment. 
I feel like I've been fortunate to say I haven't had a lot of students that we've dismissed out outside of those that qualified under, um, you know, fighting or violence or aggression and um, doing transition meetings. But um, we definitely have in our policies what that dismissal would look like in due process for parents to follow an actual procedure um, for that. I would say in the past, and I'm not sure how many else, like how many you've had or you had in um, Hollywood of meeting with those parents if there's a bad fit and, and working with the community to say, here's why and here's that. But I, I haven't had to do that a lot of, of getting there. And I feel like we try to really work with our families and kids unless they become unsafe in the environment. And of course, for students with special needs, you're still following a whole different set of guidelines of um, what does that actually look like in manifestation meetings. So that would be, I assume, a totally separate question for what you're having. I mean, if behavior is a problem or a student in special needs has a, you're going to have to follow that whole procedure for manifestation and everything else That's outside of behavior. Yeah, that would be completely different. Completely you are different. dealing yeah. with a student. You're just talking about the kid who's just not working it out. It's just not working out, and inevitably there's always yeah. one mm -hmm. and it could be the one of a parent who's quite vocal right so I would just like to know a little bit more and I didn't hear it in your response mm -hmm. about what specific procedures there are in place because my, mm -hmm. ultimately my office mm -hmm. is, you get that, that call, call. <laughs> so the last two that we had to do we called the charter office first and said we're having a problem with this child and this parent and here's what it looks like and wrote up a parent compact that said here's the behaviors here's whatever is happening and if there are this many number of more we've never like said you can't come back you know without having those conversations and I've generally worked in two different counties and worked with the parent with the charter office with that particular parent through the process uh, for me partnering with your charter office is a lot more helpful to say here's my problem and you know here's what we need to do or how can you help I have gotten so far I'm lucky gotten help twice in two different counties that I needed it Maybe one it will be that helpful. I don't know. Hey. <laughs> Just one the last thing. Compact one got us there. Oh, he's got to go. One last thing. Um, in the event everything goes through, I will encourage you to have something in writing. And that's how you get the best support Actually, from my office. Yeah. If I may suggest, what, uh, what I would like to do is part of the process, maybe we could discuss it and, and put something in place before. And mm -hmm. if the board could help in defining... Uh, I'm sorry, if you could help I, the other way around, obviously, if you could help in defining um, what we could use as a base for those for those uh, procedures, that would be awesome, and I would really appreciate your input. Thank you so much. Well, we, you know, AES is working with the school in Broward and a school in Hillsborough County and a school in whatever, so I'm surprised because you do already have established schools, and I don't think you would replicate procedures for, you know, acceptance and enrollment and dismissal. So I would think that they would be the same. And the charter office here is the charter office mm -hmm. one. So, but yeah, we do support, you know, and you know, Sarasota, we have quite a few charter schools and um, what, 15% of our students or is it 5%? I forget I should know that, but oh, 6,000 6, kids. So anyhow, okay, well, um, I think we've asked, excuse me? Al, did you? I know. I always leave Al out every time always we leaves have me this. Out, but just really okay. quick, um, you know, Sarasota County is an A school district. We have competitive salaries. We're one of the highest salaries in the state. Competitive benefits. Um, so, if you could just tell me your recruitment plan to recruit teachers that don't want to work for us, um, you know, with the great uh, schools that we have, A school district, and um, our competitive salaries and benefits. Just in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take that. It did come up actually at the at the uh, workshop session, and we talked about that. Um, I would say first and foremost, it's word of mouth, and one of the advantages that we have um, having worked here in Sar Sarasota County, Manatee, and Hillsboro is really a network of teachers that believe in the program, um, believe in the community that we have put together, and having friends and family that are local. So I'd say word of mouth is the first one. Um, the salary bands, I know we talked about them. They're competitive. They're not uh, higher and they're not lower. Um, we would be participating in a 403B as far as what our savings plan is that grows year to year, what the actual contribution and um, 
uh, match would be, starting off at 1% and, and moving up, you know, as the charter school can actually afford it. Um, I think it's a matter, which is what I said the last time, and it has always been for me an experience, is relationships. And um, it's not just about, you know, being in a school, which is fantastic, but it's about the family and the community that you have and um, teachers working together. In my experience, it's mostly having a good site school leader, and that person creates a, a climate and a culture that people want to go to um, and be at. And if somebody needs a job and 2000 or $3,000 means that they can or can't pay their mortgage, then you may lose that particular person. But if they're there because they believe in the school and in the program and you can be as close and as competitive as can be, then you will have a really good staff. Um, I do think that the... Um, Connections is probably the most important thing as far as doing that type of grassroots connecting and um, teachers bringing over teachers when they're happy. All right, that's it. Well, that concludes our questions for you. Do you have any questions of the committee at this point in time? How, how do we do? No, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Let me see no. a scale. No. <laughs> no, I just wanted to. I wanted to, to, to thank you. I wanted to thank each one of you for for the time that you put into this and for for the feedback that uh, you've given us. And if uh, if uh, we're approved, we'll certainly we would certainly use that with uh, the board's direction to improve the program. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes our meeting, and I think you're familiar with the next step, that we will convene again as a committee and go through the reports and the results of this uh, discussion, and we will finalize our report. And you are scheduled to, um, uh, at the November 7th school board meeting, we'll, where our board will take action to approve or deny your application. Great. So, thank you. And we'll be in touch. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.